You were lowly and you were despised. You were not noble, but God chose weak ones and lowly ones and despised ones and ones who weren't noble. So we come to the passage, even as he chose us. We want to begin just by thinking about the word chose. It's a word that shows up very, very frequently in the scriptures, over 50 times in the New Testament. It's all over the place in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew form. And it's not a difficult word to con- to, to uh, translate. It's not a word that's nuanced with any sort of special different meaning. It's, it's very well and very accurately translated, choose. And by choose, what is implied here is that there is a chooser who is choosing among a group of options or a group of people. In the scriptures, the word cho- choose or choice most often, in fact, I think virtually always, is a choosing unto themselves. Very very rarely would we see it as a choosing for somebody else, but it's a choosing unto oneself. And with this choosing, we see that the choice, when the choice is made, it's made among a group of, of equals or similars or like things. And when the choice is made, the choice changes the thing or the person chosen. And we see, first of all, that God chooses from the very beginning. God has always been a choosing God. From the very beginning of Scripture, we see that God chooses to create. There is no world, and then God creates a world. And so the implication there is obviously, well, God chose to create that world. And from that point, God goes on to choose and to choose and to choose and to choose all throughout the Old Testament Scriptures. He chooses, uh, for example, he chooses Noah as the one to be the one who saves humanity through the flood. He chooses Abraham from uh, the Ur of the Chaldeans, and he chooses him and tells him to leave out of that land. He's going to make a people of him. He chooses Moses as his mediator and as his spokesman to go and talk to Pharaoh. He chooses David as the king of Israel. He chooses uh, he chooses uh, Rebecca as Isaac's wife. He chooses all over the place in the Old Testament. So God has always been a God who makes choices, who chooses. And then we come in the Old Testament to God's premier choice, God's ultimate choice in the Old Testament, so to speak, is the choice that God makes of Israel, right? That was the premier choice that God makes in the Old Testament. So he chooses Israel among a group of people, among all the peoples of the earth, to be a people for, not somebody else, but for himself. And the choosing of his people changed them. It changed their status. It changed their condition. It was a choosing that was not uh, conditioned upon themselves, but instead conditioned upon God only. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. So we see God throughout the Old Testament choosing people, choosing Israel, uh, choosing this and choosing that. And then we come to the New Testament and the pattern continues. We see in John chapter 15, verse 16, we see Jesus, of course, choosing his disciples. So look at this. You did not choose me, but I chose you. That's really hard for me to imagine Jesus being clearer. I'm not sure what words he could have used to say what he said more clearly than what he just said. You did not choose me, but I chose you. So we see Jesus choosing. Furthermore, we're going to also see, we're not going to go there quite yet, but we're also going to see throughout the scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, we're going to see God choosing individuals for salvation. Now, in this choosing, we always see that God is the father of the choice. In the scriptures, when we're presented with this idea of the Trinity, when we're presented with the Trinity, we see that uh, sometimes there are those who are those persons of the Trinity that are specifically known or associated with certain things that God does. For example, we, we typically will say that Jesus or God the Son, the second person, purchased our redemption on the cross. 
But it's also just as correct to say God purchased our redemption on the cross, right? Or we say God draws sinners unto himself by convicting them of their sin and convicting them of their need for forgiveness and righteousness, right? And that's perfectly accurate and true to say, but we might be a little bit more precise and say God, the third person, the Trinity, God, the Holy Spirit, he convicts us of sin and draws us unto himself, right? Well, when we come to God's choosing, God, God's act of choosing, it is almost always the Father that's pictured as doing the choosing. From John 6 and verse 37, Jesus, Jesus says, All that the Father gives me will come to me. So you see, the actor there is the Father. The Father is said to be the one who gives to the Son a people. All that the Father gives to me will come to me. They will come to me. Why? Because the Father gave them. Or look at John 17 and verse 1. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you since you have given Him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given to Him. So there's the, the Father who again is portrayed as the actor here. He's the one who's doing the choosing and uh, the selecting there. Now, as we talked about a little bit earlier, the word choice, again, it's not a problematic word to define. It just means that there's a group of options or a group of people and a selection is made and the selection doesn't change the ones who weren't selected, but it does change the one who is selected or the thing that is selected. The status is changed based on the selection and those that aren't selected, the status is not changed. It's a selecting, a choosing out, a picking out. Take a look at Luke chapter 14, verse 7. Jesus told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor. So there's these places, places of honor, and Jesus notices that there are people that are picking out this place. Now, as they pick out that place, as the place of honor, that's the place that they want to take and they want to sit. Or take a look at Acts chapter 15 and verse 7. Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice. God made a choice among you. Now the choice was a choice among apostles. There were apostles, and God chose from among the, the apostles. Who did he choose? He chose Peter, that by Peter's mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the Lord, of the gospel. So the ones who weren't chosen remained apostles. They didn't stop being apostles because God chose Peter to be this certain apostle. But Peter was changed by the choice of him, by the selection. He then was changed in the sense that he becomes the apostle to the Gentiles. Or we see similar sorts of things in the Old Testament. For example, 1 Samuel chapter 17, the story of David and Goliath. David chooses the five stones, right? So there's a group of stones. He selects five, and those five stones become the stones that he then takes into battle. So, so much for the word itself. The word itself is not hard to understand, but the concept itself is where we now turn to. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us. So what does it mean? When Paul says, again, remember, he's not explaining, he's not defining, he's worshiping. But his worship comes from this statement, this reality that's on his mind that God chose us. What does Paul mean when he says God chose us? So let's, let's take a look now at some of the, call them alternate understandings of the doctrine of God's choice, different ways to understand God's choosing here. Let's start with the first one. The first alternate understanding, so to speak, of the doctrine of God's choosing is simply outright denial. There are those who profess the name of Christ who deny that there is any such thing as God choosing people for salvation. They affirm that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, but they would say that there is no choosing involved. What ha what's happening here is that the grace is the grace of God revealing himself to mankind and the grace of sending forth his son 
to become sin and pay the sin debt. That's the grace. And when you hear this gospel and you repent and believe, then you then are in Christ and there's no choosing whatsoever, at least not on the part of God. The choosing is on the part of the believer. That's just denial of the doctrine of election or the doctrine of God's choosing. Now, there, there are some really important strengths to that understanding. And the greatest strength is that that is precisely what the fallen human heart wants to hear. And do you know how easy it is to teach and preach what someone wants to hear? That is the easiest to accept because that flatters the human heart, that flatters the prideful heart, because it says to us that I had the spiritual wherewithal, that when I heard the gospel, yes, I'm a sinner, yes, I cannot save myself, I need a Savior, but when I heard the gospel, I had the spiritual wherewithal to believe it and to repent and to believe and give my heart to Jesus and ask Jesus into my heart and all those things. So it, the strength of it, it is, is that it is the doctrine that the fallen human heart desperately wants to hear. It's an ear tickler, exactly right. But it does, of course, have some significant weaknesses, and I can sum up those weaknesses in one word, Scripture. It's not really worth our time to spend a lot of time looking at Scriptures because it is, it's like doing battle with a house of cards. Because to deny the doctrine of God's choosing is absolutely untenable with the Scriptures. God in the Scriptures absolutely tells us that we as people are responsible for making a choice. We are responsible to hear the gospel and believe it and repent. But the Scriptures are also very, very clear to say that there's a a choice, a choosing that takes place. And so we won't really spend a lot of time on that because it, it just really is not worth our time going through the doctrine of the uh, God's choosing from the standpoint of those who would just outright deny it. But the other two, I want to talk about two more that are more common and that it's worth our time to spend a little bit more time with. One is a little less common than the second one. In fact, the first one I'm going to talk about, I didn't, I didn't really encounter that until I was in my 20s, probably maybe late 20s. And the third one that we'll talk about is very, very prevalent. I heard that one from the earliest that I can remember. So the, the, the next one that I'm, again, calling common or alternate understandings of the doctrine of God's choosing, the second one goes like this. Yes, God did choose. He made a choice. The scriptures say so. But his choice was Christ. He chose Christ. Christ is the chosen one. God chose Christ and he chose Christ in eternity past. And so Christ becomes the blessed one. Christ becomes the one, the the son who has the unique relationship. Christ becomes the elect one. Christ becomes the chosen one. And when we believe upon Christ by faith, we are united with Christ And his righteousness covers us. We are then hidden in Christ. And because we are hidden in Christ and God chose Christ, he therefore, in a sense, chose us. Now, does that sound biblical? That sounds very biblical. It sounds biblical because I use biblical words and I use lots of allusions to Scripture there. And I made that sound very much biblical. In fact, that position is is maybe not the most common understanding of the doctrine of God's choosing, but it is definitely out there. I want to spend just a few minutes and show us from the scriptures why that cannot be true. Why it cannot be possible that God's choosing was a choosing of Christ. And now our choice to believe puts us in Christ and by association or by union with Christ, we too are also chosen. I want to show us from this very passage And some other scriptures, why it is that that cannot be the understanding that Paul has in mind. That cannot be what the scriptures are teaching. First of all, that cannot be the understanding because the passage itself says so. Paul says 
even as he chose who? Us. He simply doesn't say that God chose Christ. He says God chose us. A few statements later, he's going to say he predestined who? Not Christ, us. And so to understand that that what Paul is saying here is that he chose Christ. And as we are in Christ, we then become chosen also. To say that that's what Paul's saying here just simply doesn't work with the passage. It's forcing words to say what they don't say. So the passage itself tells us it cannot be Paul's understanding. Let's look at some other scriptures that are going to show us, I think rather plainly, that God not only chooses Christ as his elect one, he also chooses individuals to be in Christ. And he makes that choice, as Paul's going to say in a couple of weeks, before the foundation of the world. Take a look with the ad. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 31. Take a, take a look at the flow of what Paul says here. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. In other words, Paul says, consider, consider who you are in Christ and consider where you came from. You came from backgrounds in which you weren't powerful. You weren't wise. You weren't noble. You weren't born with a silver spoon in your mouth. But God chose. Now, what did God choose? What is foolish in the world? And he did it to shame the wise. He goes on. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are. So clearly here, Paul says that God chose And the things that he chose were weak, despised, lowly, not wise, but instead low and despised. Now, we might say, wait a minute, wasn't Jesus all those things? Yes, he was. After his incarnation. Look at what Paul says here. The text is plain. God chose what is weak where? In the world. It doesn't say that God chose Christ and when he became a man, he became weak. It says that God chose what is weak in the world, what is foolish, what is lowly, what is despised. So Paul here has in mind the specific choice of people. He just said to the Corinthians, remember who you were. You were this way. You were lowly and you were despised. You were not noble. But God chose weak ones and lowly ones and despised ones and ones who weren't noble. And then look at what he says. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. Now, if God's choice was to choose Christ, and as we believed upon Christ, we were then put into Christ and became the chosen ones, then what would you expect Paul to say there instead of, And because of him, you're in Christ. You would expect him to say, and because of faith, you're in Christ. Because that's what he would mean. If God's choice was Christ, and our belief in Christ puts us into the chosen, then Paul would have said, and because of your faith, you're in Christ. But he says, because of him, meaning the father, the chooser, the one who does the choosing. Look also at Revelation chapter 13. And verse 7, also it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. He's speaking here of the beast. It was allowed for the beast to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nation. So here's this beast that we're going to read about in Revelation. And he's given authority. And part of that authority uh, results in his being worshipped. And all who dwell on the earth will worship it. All who dwell on the earth are going to worship the beast. Does that mean everybody? No, there is a category of people who will not worship the beast. And the category of people is the category of people who don't fit this description. Every been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who was slain. In other words, there are people who will be alive when the beast is receiving worship who won't worship the beast because their name is in the book. And so the point here is that there is a name 
There are names. There are people's names in this book. Now, why would there be a book with people's names in it from the foundation of the world if God didn't choose people whose names are going to be in that book? So uh, take a look now at John 17, verse 6. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me. That just doesn't work with this idea of God choosing Christ and then those who choose to believe in Christ become God's people. That just doesn't work with that. I have manifested your name to who? To the people. There's a people that you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, meaning they were before they believed. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they've kept your word. The next one is John 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me. All that the Father gives me will come to me. That, again, just doesn't mesh with this idea that Christ was elect, Christ was chosen, and those who choose to believe in Christ themselves become part of the chosen. Or lastly, John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father me draws him. Why would there be a father drawing certain people if Jesus was the chosen one and all who believed in him became the chosen one? So I think that we we get that now. God does not choose Christ. God does choose Christ, but God does not choose Christ only. 